Bob Coburn assumed office as the city of Muskogee's 48th mayor on February 20th, 2012. Bob was born in Altus, Oklahoma and moved to Muskogee in 1960 for his dad to become involved with Coburn Optical. He attended Longfellow Elementary, West Junior High, and graduated from Central High School in 1970. He then attended Northeastern State College and Connor State College. He married Gwen Ammons and has two children and four grandchildren. He lived and worked in Virginia and Arkansas with Coburn Optical for 10 years. Bob came back to Muskogee in 1983 buying Coburn Tuxedo and then A of any self storage in 1998. He is a deacon at First Baptist Church. He has served on the Muskogee City Council, the Board of Directors for McCoy's, City Muskogee Foundation, Muskogee Port Authority, and the Muskogee Chamber of Commerce. He is on the Chamber's Tourism and Vision Committee, and he has previously served as the President of Rotary. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Bob Coburn. today, not just things that I want to say, but things that the city wants to say as well. The Chamber of Commerce wants to say, uh, and the various entities of the city, and uh, I'm excited to get the opportunity to do this. Sometimes you get a little discouraged, you think, gosh, are we making any progress? This helps renew that effort. That, that builds the fire back inside you to say, we are. And I'm pleased to say that, that uh, we are. Let me introduce a couple of people uh, along the way. My wife, Gwen. If she could stand, they have joined us at our table, and we appreciate them so much for doing it. It's feel a little, a little tight, room-wise. We did that because the uh, veterans, uh, that there's 2,400 strong serving uh, and, and, and offering uh, benefits and so forth, had a meeting and they needed a room for 1,500 people. And they were downstairs all morning. Uh, and so we said, heck yes, put us upstairs. We'll be a little crowded for the additional revenue that it, that it provides, as well as the opportunity. <laughs> as well as the opportunity that it gives the VA's, I guess, a regional director to be here to speak to their employees and staff. And so we were glad to, uh, to do that. Thank you to uh, Kimber Scott for helping with the uh, uh, put this presentation piece uh, together. Excellent job. Chamber of Commerce, outstanding uh, to work with always and uh, very appreciative uh, of everybody in that, in that effort. We have a lot to do. We're going to start with a video. Uh, John Dallas has helped us put this video together and we are really, really pleased with what we see in the video. So uh, without any more, uh, we'll just look at John's work here. <coughs> Uh, let me introduce a couple of people to you uh, that are really not new to Muskogee. Uh, let me introduce Howard Brown, uh, sitting right here. Stand up to you with Howard. I'm sitting right here. <laughs> well, the history of Muskogee and on the ground eight or nine or so months and uh, involved in a lot of projects uh, at this point. Eric Miller, uh, Director of uh, Business Economic uh, Development. Really is new to the ground. I mean, he's 20, maybe what, two months? Yes. Maybe just a, a fraction over that. So, uh, but he's already got it all figured out at this point, and he's figured out how we're going to move Muskogee ahead, and he's already a part of that. And uh, it's great. I had an opportunity to spend a, a, in a meeting with him uh, this week, and it was like, whoa, what an understanding he's already got of what we have in terms of assets and opportunities for Muskogee. This is going to take uh, uh, just a couple of minutes, but again, it's going to take a little. Um, Disruption. If you have a letter at your table, would you have one person at your table bring the letter and come to the front here right in front of the podium? 
If you have a letter, it's probably sitting in the chair. Census population from for the last hundred years for both cities. She looked it up for only 1900 basically until now. And it's interesting. Muskogee has not changed in population in 65 years. Fort Smith and Muskogee 65 years ago were the exact same virtually the exact same population. They're now 80, 86,000 in population, and we're still 39,000 in population. So when I say it's time for us to experience some pain and some change and some growth, that's exactly where I'm coming from. It's going to make us uncomfortable to grow. It's going to inconvenience us. But it is so, so necessary that we do that. John Maxwell's saying, I, I, it just gripped me when I saw that uh, and heard that uh, said. Change is inevitable. Growth is, or are we going to choose to grow? 
Let me tell you about some successes that we have in Mississippi, and then I want to offer a challenge uh, in a closing comment in a, in a few minutes. Let's say that's going to be a half an hour. <laughs> Information technology, which would be the first slide that we go to. We explored, and I, I came to work and I said, but just give me the uh, uh, voicemail and I'll leave them a message. The person I was wanting to talk to, I said, you can't do that. We don't have a phone system that allows you to leave voicemail. I said, really? you got to be kidding me. So we, we started on this process, and I think we had this process of evaluating what a phone system would, would cost that we could leave an email or we could leave a voice message and do a few of the other modern convenient things that happen. Well, in that discovery process, we came up with a cost savings of $120,000 a year. We went from 400 phone lines and numbers at the various entities in the city that number is now reduced to 48 with internet protocol phone system. With 38 phone numbers, and I think this is kind of an alert that can go up that costs someone in a, in, a, in a larger situation to say, wow, I wonder if we have the same thing. IT discovered we had 38 phone lines we were paid for. So a memo went out that we couldn't find who, who was at the receiving end of the number. So IT sent a message out that said, we're gonna start cutting these off. We're gonna start eliminating these lines if you experience any disruption to your service, let us know. There wasn't any disruption to service. <laughs> I don't say that for that to be embarrassing. I say that to say change is going to cause some pain, and we're going to need to grow as a city. And I'm proud that we did that. We made that step, uh, and, and that that was accomplished. We're in the process of updating our website which is badly in need. They're going to become a part of our website will become an online reporting system, which many cities already have. You know, if you have a bottle, you have a, a water line issue, you can literally report it and track the progress of that online. Uh, city parks, hat box uh, park and sports complex master plan was approved September 2014. Uh, and it's a pretty aggressive plan for us. And there's a board somewhere around it, uh, around the room that will have uh, uh, the full plan for the 425 acres that there is at Hatbox. We utilize, you know, kind of uh, a third to a half. There's another third to a half that needs to be developed, and that's a process that we're going through, and I think you will find that to be an exciting process. We're going to need to discover, discover in that process where to come up with about 35 or $40 million to make that happen. That will allow us to have a new expo center, that will allow us to have new sports, some new additions to the sports facilities. Uh, it will allow an agricultural element to happen uh, at that location as well. I know there's a lot of people in the larger community in the county uh, that, that would love to see that happen. Uh, but you could have everything in, in this type of facility at Hatbox from a, uh, from a wedding uh, to a, a Muscogee Hilldale graduation uh, or a barrel race event the next night or a bucking event as well. That's being explored uh, at, this, at this time and we're trying to figure out the priorities to make that happen. On our Heights Park Tourist Destination Plan, there's a plan that's been put together that would require over about a two-year period of time, time an opportunity for us to literally rebuild a lot of the, uh, the plantings uh, and, and the beauty of the park. Uh, ice storms, uh, have been a big issue. Drought has been a big issue. Uh, plants that have, out, have grown them, their, their, their normal life uh, has been an issue as well. So that is being presented uh, to the City of Muskogee Foundation for potential uh, funding, and we're excited about seeing that potentially happen. The uh, Muskogee Police Department. One of the more exciting things going on in the Muskogee Police Department is, uh, is uh, Taser, Axon, Flex Cameras. Body, body cams uh, for our police officers. It provides additional safety, it provides security, it documents what happens in the event, and then when you download that uh, information, then it's, it's uh, maintained uh, for a period of time uh, for, in the secure safety. Uh, just normal city of Muskogee operational things. We underwent a complete insurance changeover, uh, guaranteeing to us a complete network savings of $400,000. Pretty interesting. Uh, insurance committee worked hard. Tough decisions were made, and, and but that, that process came forward. Safety is a priority. 
and, and it's got to become a priority in our training of our employees that work for the city. We need to create what we would refer to as a safety culture. And when I say safety culture, I've had the opportunity to be in, in a couple of manufacturing facilities. Valorec that was on the screen a minute ago where their president was being uh, recognized. Every place you look, I mean, you literally can't make a right turn or a left turn without something speaking safety to you in that environment. Uh, Georgia Pacific was the other one that had the opportunity to be in. You literally, every place you go, safety, 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 and interestingly, their results are there to prove that that makes a significant difference. We began a new budgeting process uh, this past year. Our budget totally has a, a different look to it. Uh, whether you read, you, you would read, you would look at numbers, you look at spreadsheets, you would look at and goals, opportunities, challenges, those things are beginning to emerge in that budget process. So we have, we have a chance to, to look at those, evaluate those, look at them quarterly, look at them annually, challenge uh, the department and operations, uh, and it's been an interesting process to go through. It's one that will probably take several years for us to complete uh, to where we understand exactly what the budget process puts together in terms of a management tool, but we're headed in that direction we've made that first step. <coughs> Planning department, housing rehabilitation and revitalization. We've been and worked on that for uh, quite some time. Provided funding uh, up to about $20,000 per structure in terms of changing the exterior of the home so we don't get additional dilapidated homes in the community at an alarming rate. At the, point, at the present time, we probably have 50 structures per year residentially that go on to a, a demolition list uh, for potential removal uh, from the community. The program is funded again by a grant from the City of Muskogee Foundation, uh, and over the next two-year period, we would anticipate taking down about four to 500 structures and, and literally remove them. It will revitalize and it will add new life into the community and into the neighborhood. And you'll see neighborhoods then begin to uh, revitalize themselves when this effort starts. And you'll see a change in a, in a cohesiveness begin to develop in neighborhoods. Additionally, the demolition plan uh, would create a, a safer environment, which we're very concerned about, obviously, uh, in, in, our, in our efforts. Mm -hmm. Housing incentive program. We developed the housing incentive program because we looked at what happens when you create four or 500 more vacant lots to go along with the vacant lot inventory that we already have. So there's gotta be an incentive program to say, come back and build in this neighborhood, come back and change this neighborhood. And that can, that's not gonna just happen naturally without some incentivization. You aren't gonna normally just come and buy a lot uh, that's surrounded by several other derelict structures and so forth. So if you get the derelict structures down, then you offer an opportunity, you offer an incentive, you give someone a reason to come back into the neighborhood and build a new house uh, themselves to create an owner-occupied situation. Or you give a developer a reason to come back into the neighborhood and say, hey, I'm interested in building 10 or 15 houses and, re and really changing what this neighborhood looks like. And that uh, process is in in effect right now, and we're getting ready to see how that works out. Uh, inspection and code enforcement. I'm sad to tell you that we continue to spend a half a million dollars a year to say, clean up your neighborhood, clean up your business, clean up your junky lot. I don't know whether that means anything to you, but we spend a half a million dollars a year. And if you give the condition that we're in right now, we're not making a great headway at a half a million dollars a year. So should we spend a million dollars a year? And turns around just going to clean up the neighborhood, mow your grass, cut your weeds, you know, fix the broken windows. We have 1,100 violations a year that are taken down. On the reverse side of that, there's 717 building permits that have been issued, and we've got $53 million worth of work going on in those 1,700. Now, a little bit of a hailstorm helped that. <laughs> but hey, we'll take it because that creates uh, a material sales at the same time, which, which generates additional sales tax revenue. We're in the process of going through the comprehensive land use map and rezoning process, uh, and that is just about complete. That's been a two-year process in planning. Uh, Gary Garvin's department in planning and 
that group, uh, they had been busy at that for a long time. I know they'd be glad to go, we got that completed. You know, that'll help give us consistency and continuity uh, in our neighborhoods and business areas. Uh, City of Muskogee Foundation had the opportunity, Ernie Gilder, a friend of mine, said, hey, can you go pass out these scholarship presentations? Uh, I'm going to be out of town. I said, sure, I'd like to. I'd love to do that. I went to Hilldale and had the opportunity to change three young people's lives forever. A couple days later, I had the opportunity to go to Muskogee High School and change seven young people's lives forever. That was a quarter of a million dollars that was done. That is now up to a cumulative amount of $900,000 that have been given to Hillville and Muskogee graduates. And I think that's something we can all be proud of as a community, every single one of us. Uh, Aim. Thank you to Tim Bolton. Thank you to Lisa Wade for chairing uh, the AIM process for us. Thank you to Brian Thorstenberg that brought the idea to us originally to sit down uh, literally in this room over a series of about four or five meetings and had a thousand folks involved in that process to say, where are we as a community? Where do we want to be as a community? And how are we going to get there? And out of that has come many, many more meetings and many more good ideas and the refining of those ideas into a plan that is being put into place uh, literally as we speak. Uh, before long, across the street, literally, from where we sit now, you'll see the Muskogee Little Theater uh, going up with, uh, that was up part of the slideshow at uh, six and a half million dollars. You'll see Mark Luther King Community Center break around in January, which will be another four, four and a half million dollar project that will literally transform the way we look as a community. The Oklahoma Music Hall of Fame. A couple of years ago, I said uh, we're either going to do something with the Oklahoma Music Hall of Fame or we're going to look back sadly and say we missed the opportunity and someone took it away from us. And I'm proud, proud to say to you that the Oklahoma Music Hall of Fame has a direction and they are doing very, very well today. getting ready to come to us with a uh, outdoor music event that's being planned for 2015 or 2016 to literally go out to uh, Hatbox Field area uh, uh, and put an outdoor event together that would literally draw thousands and thousands of people to have an outdoor music event. The, the preparation is being done for that right now. The, the funding is being explored right now. So look for 2015 or 2016 summers that you'll see a huge music event sponsored by the Oklahoma Music Hall of Fame that will be a, really a game changer. Induction ceremony is uh, at 2014 at Kane's Ballroom, November 1st, 2014. General admission tickets are still available. VIP tickets are already sold out at this point. So November 1st, 2014, Kane's Ballroom. <laughs> Weekly programs and consistent attendance. I don't know whether you've been, and if you haven't been, let me just say on Thursday nights generally, now, occasionally it clicks over to a Friday or Saturday night, but generally on a Thursday night, there is something going on musically at the Oklahoma Music Hall of Fame. You can have a few snacks, you can have a few things to drink, you can listen to some fantastic music, and you certainly will be met by a very gracious staff uh, to do that. And thank you for Oklahoma Music Hall of Fame. Sales tax recovery. I want you to think about when you, excuse me, when you go to Tulsa, you go to Oklahoma City, you just drive around, you say, hey, I need to take a gas. You know, my wife says, every time we get in a car, it's like my light goes off, you know, and says, we need gas. And she says, is it me? Every time we get in the car, we need gas. And I said, we're going to drive back to Muskogee and fill up with gas. We're not going to fill up with Tulsa. We went there to a soccer game the other day. Light went off the bell. <laughs> well, here's how we did. We made it all the way back to Muskogee. <laughs> We figured out that the, between the bell ringing and out of gas is about a 50 mile process. So we're not going to venture out further than 50 miles, so we're good. And here's, here's what I want to make, the point I want to make with that. 0.16 cents per gallon of gasoline, 0.16 cents, 0.13 cents on, on diesel. When you fill up outside the city of Muskogee, 
With gasoline, you just gave somebody four dollars of your road repair money in another community. If you do that with diesel, you just gave away six dollars and fifty cents that the city of Muskogee will not get for street and road repair. Kind of an interesting thought, isn't it? The shop Muskogee is important. It's important to everyone that's sitting in this room. More than we realize. 52% of our revenue comes from sales tax. And we generate that sales tax. It's a conscious decision that we have to think about. Where am I going to shop? When am I going to shop? And I'm going to shop at home as much as I possibly can. And I'm not saying everything you buy is going to be in Muskogee, but most of what you buy, you need to look at in Muskogee, if you can. Internet sales, big problem in terms of every city in the state of Oklahoma. In our case, it's about $30 million a year that's being spent outside the city that we do not get sales tax revenue for. As a city, we miss the opportunity as a state, we miss the opportunity as a county. So it's incredibly important uh, that we shop at home. Port of Muskogee, I did, uh, as I mentioned to you, I had the opportunity to spend some time talking about the water lab. Did you realize the city of Muskogee, the Port of Muskogee, is a $2 billion investment up and down the sides of the river in terms of manufacturing and manufacturing related jobs? You have 3,000 people who are literally working here because of the port, that job is supported. That produces $150 million in payroll into this community. And you know, we, we just think about it, gee, we just drove across with the bridge there, we looked at the port, and wow, I didn't realize the impact that it has. And we, need, we certainly need to capitalize on that every, day, every way that we possibly can. <clears throat> Educational opportunities. Muskogee, Mike Gard, uh, does a great job in helping this city. Uh, from the standpoint of moving Muskogee education ahead of Muskogee Public Schools, uh, May, 20, May 2013 bond issue passed by 84%. And I think that's a pretty strong uh, recognition by the city and the citizens and the voters to say, that's important to us and we want to be behind it in terms of changing the educational system in Muskogee in a positive way. To think that 24 people, 2,400 people now have a take-home device through Muskogee Public Schools that they can get, rather than a hard copy textbook, a way to communicate, a way to do study and research. Uh, and, and I think it's a phenomenal thing. There's $29.9, $30 million for so that as facilities for 15.4%, uh, 15.4 million dollars of it is technology. I'm about to get tongue tied. AR Middle School has got a science building going up. You haven't had an opportunity to drive back, buy that, you need to do that. Tab Lab at Muskogee High School, plus many, many other facilities that were in the, the uh, overhead uh, that we just had. Kaylin Goody at Hilltop Schools said it's important to us that we have a police presence in, in, on our campuses and really work through the process to get that to happen with the Muskogee Police Department and the shared resource of an officer. And congratulations uh, to them in that effort. NSU, Dr. Turner. Occupational therapy program, first class to begin 2014. Second class to begin 2015. I thought that was pretty logical. Three-year master's program received a $900,000 grant to begin that program through the City of Muskogee Foundation. Thank you, City of Muskogee Foundation, for impacting this. City of Muskogee Foundation, just a quick piece to put in uh, that's not on the notes. Started with $92 million, 2007 28. It's at $135 million now. It's grown by $60 million, and we've granted $20 million in grants in that same year. NSU additionally is looking at and in partway through the process of a physician assistant program uh, that will really be a game changer in terms of this being a uh, allied health hub for Muskogee. And we're pleased with those efforts. They come with Frank Willis rejuvenating and renovating the Adelaide Lodge to its original state and completing paperwork for that upcoming historical site. And we appreciate that effort. Adding a music and arts program uh, to the list of degree programs that are available through Bay Cone. Bacon just kind of sits out there sometimes and we just don't pay attention 
We just don't acknowledge their efforts. And, and when we need to do that, we want to do that. In terms of expansion and remodeling, just one that we didn't get in the program earlier, James Hodge Ford has only done a $4 million renovation on South Main Street. Thank you for that. Uh, we may have a slide at the three corners at uh, 69 Highway and 62, Shawnee and 69. Quick trip corner down at the bottom left. The, the blue block that you see on the remaining three corners, that's an opportunity that has since 1955, that intersection has been there and not, not, you haven't seen the growth that we have the potential to grow. And we will see that, that intersection change over the next two or three years. Obviously, with the quick trip, you'll see a huge amount of traffic change uh, as that corner continues to develop. And I think you'll see the other three as we move forward. There's a, a significant interest in uh, Shawnee and 69 Highway in Muscovy from outside people looking in saying, we want to be a part of that, the traffic that is that built there. Uh, Bridges for the Future of Muscovy, the initiative by the by the city, which is taken on by Tom Martindale, who did our prayer a few minutes ago, uh, really has been a game changer. 4,300 families in between 2011 and 2014 have been reduced from poverty level uh, in our community, according to the, Amer the Bureau's uh, American Community Survey indication. 25.6% uh, to 19.4% the past two years. They're making a difference in, in the scope. And Marvin. Where is Marvin? Said, Marvin, stand up just a minute. I'm going to embarrass you just for a second. Marvin and I have become friends over the last couple of years through this program. He has gone from an explorer through that program to figure out what, what that means in his life to a graduate that is now has spent some time in Oklahoma City at a national conference for Bridges Out of Poverty and employed in the community in a significant way and is making a difference. And you can see a smile on his face and you can see a smile on his heart. Change is inevitable. Change is inevitable. And growth is optional. Where do we go? Do we really want to change? Do we really want to grow as a community? Uh, let me ask you this question. And think about this just a second. If we know the problem, and if we know the solution, would we as a city have the courage to fix it? Part of that is the change, and the change causes pain, and the pain causes discomfort to us. Would we have the courage to fix it? We seem to know what the problems are, and we know what the solutions are, and we have the opportunity now to make those changes as a community. Two other thoughts, and then we'll close. Glenn Smith was doing some research on the Jefferson Highway, the highway that goes from, from Canada to uh, uh, New Orleans. And in that research, he came across an article. The article was written in 1916. And the article says this, we are 40,000 strong. Did you hear me? In 1916, that article was written. Just as there was beginning to be travel on paved roads, you know, new cars, the experience to be out and about uh, in your vehicle uh, for a vacation travel, 1916, that was said. Uh, the 2015 convention of the Jefferson Highway is going to be in Muskogee next summer. And you'll have an opportunity to learn more about that. But the point I'm making is, in 1916, they were so proud of the fact that there were 40,000 strong as a community. George Ladd's personal friend of mine, George moved his medical practice here in 1967. Why he moved his medical practice here in Pueblo, Colorado? As he said, I got a chance to visit Muskogee and he said, all I could see was it was getting ready to change. In 1967, 
he made that observation about the scope. Things are in place. The stars are lining up. We're about to change as a community. Well, I'm sad to report to you that, uh, you know, 50 years later, in some cases, in population, we haven't changed in size. We're not growing. We're not growing. So we haven't taken the opportunity, even though we're at the door, we're at that threshold. And my question to you is this, the challenge to you is this, Muskogee has the opportunity right now to grow, more than I've seen since I moved back here in 1983. There's more things happening right now that can move us ahead. <coughs> and my question is this to you, will you join me as we step forward into growth? Thank you.